first, so perfect layers, it's a layered workflow solution that works in Lightroom and Aperture uh, and as a standalone product. So you can access uh, perfect layers from either of those products. Um, we built the most useful layers tools uh, that we thought were, uh, you know, would fit into a photographer's workflow, like blending exposures, being able to create intriguing composites uh, from several images, so taking a portion of this photo and a portion of that photo and blending them together. And then finally, um, you know, masking elements, so from one image in Lightroom to onto another image in Lightroom. Uh, typically, you would do that if you want to kind of swap out a head um, or change the sky of an image. So why would you want to choose perfect layers? We hear the most common feedback from photographers that photographers love Lightroom. Uh, the typical phrase is, I do all of my work in Lightroom. And whatever I can do to speed up my workflow, that's I want to at least have that option available to me. Also, Perfect Layers, um, it gives you some unique functionality to existing concepts, like blending preview. Um, currently, if you try to do blending previews and in other products like Photoshop, you actually have to cycle through those blending modes. Um, with Perfect Layers, we built live previews. So as you hover over each blending mode, you'll see that preview uh, appear on your main image. And we also have a trim tool, which is a cool little tool to make masking much easier, especially if you have a defined shape that you want to mask out. Now here's some of the finer points of the, this Perfect Layers public preview release. The official title of this current release is Perfect Layers Public Preview. So not every feature is even baked in yet to Perfect Layers, which means it's only going to get bigger, faster, better, and easier when we release it midsummer. Um, there may be some bugs and instabilities. That's just you know kind of the, the um, path you take with releasing public preview releases. So we're okay with that because it's with your help and your feedback that will allow us to ensure that when we do release the final version to the public, it is the best possible release uh, that you can get. Uh, we really want to work and collaborate with you guys on this. So what I'm going to do now is um, I want to tell you a little bit about Seth. Most of you who are familiar with our webinar program, uh, Seth should not be a stranger to you because he's done monthly webinars with us. He actually just did one last week. So I, a person I want to thank Seth for you know coming around circle so quickly for the Perfect Layers uh, All-Star Week. But also, Seth has, was chosen as one of the 30 most influential photographers of the decade by Photo District News Magazine, PDN Magazine. Seth's, uh, <coughs> excuse me, one of North America's most prolific corporate editorial and stock photographers and he's greatly in demand for his beautiful his beautiful graphic images as you'll see um, in both natural and creative light. Uh, Seth's been published in some of the world's most prestigious magazines and he's also the co-founder of D65 which is a really cool organization that teaches digital work uh, workflow workshops, webinars and one-on-one -on -one trainings. So um, I'll give you Seth's uh, information at the end of the webinar if you want to learn more about him. And Seth's also one of Canon's uh, Explorers of Light, which is also fantastic. So with that, I'm just going to hide this screen right here, and I'm going to pass control over to my friend Seth. Uh, just give me one second to do that. Okay, Seth, you should be able to share your screen yeah. and have fun. Good morning, everybody. Um, this is uh, should be a lot of fun. I've picked out some images to play with. And um, uh, a couple of things I just want to say. One of the questions that I've gotten already from several of my uh, cohorts is, you know, why why use this? Why not Photoshop? What's the difference? And it was in, it's interesting to think about. From but from my perspective, I think one of the things I found the most useful here is that there's, you know, a million things you can do in Photoshop, and there's a million ways to do them. But you have to think about what it is you want to do. And one of the neat things about this program is it, it, only does, it only does certain things, so it sort of forces creativity to do what, what it does best. And, and um, I mean, I found I've, I've actually made some very interesting images because of the software initiating me to play in a certain way that I wouldn't have otherwise probably done on my own in, um, in Photoshop. So um, I just wanted to add that to what Brian said. And I'm going to sort of start out pretty easy, and then we're going to get up to some rather complicated stuff. And um, let's give it a whirl. So the first thing is an image I shot uh, about a week ago in Norway. 
And this is the, the, the picture over here. And what I want to do is actually create a, um, a virtual copy of this as a black and white, and then essentially paint the color back into their faces. So it looks more like a, um, a, a hand retouched black and white, if you will. So um, rather than also do all these steps ahead of time and just uh, show you the end results, we're actually taking the real chance of doing this all in live time right from the scratch. So if there are any little bugs or niches, I apologize ahead of time. So what we're going to do is I'm going to do command apostrophe or create virtual copy. And we now have a virtual copy of the image. And I'm going to take the virtual copy. I'm going to open up the develop module. And I'm going to very simply go in under the HSL panel and convert this to black and white. I'm going to actually hit auto just to clean it up a little bit. And now I'm going to go back to the library. And I'm going to select both images. So I have the original color, if you will, and then the, um, the virtual copy. And virtual copies are not really second images. They're, uh, in essence, a duplication of the metadata. So, um, but from these, I can produce a, a real image output. So I'm going to select both of these. And I'm going to go up to Plug-in Extras. And I'm going to choose Perfect. There we go. I'm going to choose Perfect Layers. I'm also. Um, probably against advice. I'm doing this on raw files, so it, um, there may be a little bit of a, de of a uh, delay. But um, again, I want you to see how it all really, really does work. So I now have my uh, layered file, if you will, and I, I use that term lightly on my desktop. And I'm going to just take opacity down a little bit. I'm going to go to my brush over here, and I'm going to paint out, if you will, a little bit of color so that we have that effect of a hand retouched black and white. Very, very simple, but very, very neat and very, very quick to accomplish that look. And I and you know if I was actually spending a little more time in this, I probably would have started out with even a lower opacity and just made a, added a little bit of color. But very, very cool. And then I can save this and one of the advantages is that I can actually save this directly back into Lightroom and keep on editing it in Lightroom. To save a little bit of time and to show you some other, um, other examples, I'm going to can that, per se. So I'm going to just quit Perfect Layers now and not save that. I will show you that uh, at this point in time, every time I uh, create something, there's going to be a PSD file that is naturally created. And so that we don't, con so that I don't confuse you as I go on, I'm also going to delete the uh, actual PSD from that from that file. The next one is um, we'll bump it up a little bit, and it's this image, and um, pretty interesting image. It it was shot in New York about a week ago, and um, uh, really really cool sky. I mean, I was I haven't seen a sky like this in a long time. And the idea here is that what I want to do is I'm going to, um, again, make a virtual copy. But this time, I'm going to um, accentuate the warmth of the image dramatically and then paint that warmth into the foreground so it sort of looks like um, uh, the sun setting. And I'm going to do it with different opacities throughout. Um, and anyways, you'll, you'll see what happens, but pretty cool. So again, I'm going to go photo, uh, create virtual copy, or command apostrophe. And I'll show you what that looks like in the grid. So we now have the original and the uh, duplicate. And I'm going to take this duplicate and make some um, pretty dramatic adjustments here in order to give it the warmth of what I'm looking for. I'm actually going to take the uh, temperature slider and crank it all the way over, uh, let's see, maybe about 20, 
22549. How's that? I know that because I played with this ahead of time. Um, and then I'm going to uh, add the tinter, tint up, adding magenta to warm it up further. Take that up to about 69. And I'm going to bump up exposure to quite high, actually, about two and a quarter, right about here. And then we'll move fill light up a little bit to about 20. And black, I want at one. Just let's type that in. And then brightness, we're going to actually drop to about 12. Brightness is affecting my uh, midtone. And I'm going to drop contrast just a hair to about 37. And then two other little changes. I'm going to go down to HSL. And on saturation, I'm going to bump up saturation on red to uh, 15 and yellow to 20. And then I'm going to drop the luminance of both of those down as well to negative uh, 20. So I'm just going to lower the uh, impact, if you will. Okay, so now I have um, clearly what is a, an exceedingly warm image, but what I was really looking for here is the effect of what I've got in the buildings, not, not so much of what's going on in the sky, which is uh, highly ridiculous looking. Um, so with that, I'm going to go back to uh, the library. I'm going to select both of these images. And again, I'm going to uh, go to my plug-in extras, and I'm going to go to perfect layers. And again, these are uh, large RAW files, so uh, it's going to take a minute, and hopefully your screens are keeping up with me. And we're compositing it. So now I have, now I have my background and foreground. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to swap my background with my foreground. And I'm going to start out with a rather low opacity. Well, maybe about here. I'm going to pick my brush. And let me just get my brush size a little bigger. And actually, I even want it lower than that. Sorry. Okay. So what I'm doing is sort of adding the effects of sun. And I was uh, using the wrong slider, which sometimes helps to use the right one. This is the opacity slider I want. So we're going to add a highlight now. So by using the different different opacities, um, and that's that's pretty quick. But what's really neat, I mean, it really does look like um, this uh, natural gray sky which we had, and then by painting in the different opacities on the on the foreground from the um, composite that was exceedingly warm, it really does take a be believable quality of uh, late afternoon sunlight hitting these buildings and. Um, um, when I started playing with this, I was actually, I mean, this was one of the first ones that I did and was very impressed at how well it worked. Um, and something that I definitely would have never thought of with Photoshop it was just sort of a, uh, you know, a creative natural occurrence, if you will. Um, so let me um, close that one. Just don't save here. And again, you'll see that it has created a PSD file, and I'm going to just delete that PSD, and then we'll move on. Um, the next one uh, is a is a little bit more complicated, and it's um, 
an image that I did of the uh, Empire State Building last week when I was in New York. And um, there's actually two to show, but this one's actually kind of probably the coolest one to play with. Um, so I'm going to duplicate this again. I'm going to make a, uh, a virtual copy. And the virtual copy, uh, I'm going to make the virtual copy sort of like a, um, like similar to a sepia tone. Uh, and then blend that with color blending so that the um, sky, so that I have a, a blue sky and the Empire State Building is naturally colored and then the background all becomes sort of a sepia tone black and white. Um, and we'll see if this works. This is a little tougher. So um, again, I'm going to go in and choose Create Virtual Copy. And I'm going to take that virtual copy and quite a few uh, adjustments here to do. Um, I'm going to go to black and white first. And I'm going to on HSL. Uh, and I'm just going to punch these numbers, and I played with this ahead of time. Minus 33, minus 10. And you get these by playing. I mean, that's. Um, it took a fair amount of time to to get the effects that I wanted, but um, uh, you know this is part of part of Lightroom and part of I think Photoshop and everything else is uh, having fun and playing around and seeing what different effects will do. And I knew the direction I wanted to head, but the exact numbers uh, were a bit of a mystery. So 18, 60. And then seven, and then I'm going to go to split toning, and I'm going to split tone this image. And uh, to see the effects of split toning, by the way, I hold down the Option key, and I can get the color palette that I want by um, with the slider. And I'm actually going to go to about 49, and then increase saturation. So I see that effect to about 35. And then on my blues, I'm going to push it way up to 236 and 40. And then I'm going to balance it to actually to the right to warm this so that it has the warming effect. Uh, we'll go to about 90 something here. 98 is pretty good. And then just a couple of little other odds and ends, I'm going to come up to my uh, uh, treatment panel, and I'm going to change the color temperature uh, just a hair on tint to 13. And then tone, I'm going to uh, bring uh, my brightness way up to just my midtones to about 125. That's pretty close. Uh, we're going to lower contrast just a hair. And clarity, we're going to add a little clarity to boost the midtone contrast. So that's pretty close to what I was looking for. Now I'm going to take, go back to my grid, and I'm going to take both of these images. And again, I'm going to go into. Uh, Export, export plugin uh, extras rather. Choose perfect layers. We'll wait for these to come up. And again, fairly large images here from a uh, 5D Mark II and a 1DS Mark III. And what we're going to do here is let me go to the brush and I'm going to go to a different blend mode actually to color blending and paint out so the first thing I'm going to do is give myself a the blue sky and the Empire State Building and obviously, it would take a little more time than what I'm doing with you guys right now. But you get the idea here. 
amazing how quick or not. So as I come around, I'm going to clean up this edge, clean this up. So I'm going to do the big area first. And then I'm going to lower the opacity and go around the edges so that it makes a better blend. So that's pretty close there. Now I'm going to bring the opacity way down, well, or down considerably. And I can just sort of clean up these edges. And there's a couple little spots in here, too. And add a little bit in here. And again, you get you get the idea. Um, I, I when I did this for real, I spent a little more time than what I just did. But a very very neat effect. And again, something that I wouldn't, you know, I I wouldn't have thought about doing naturally. Um, certainly wouldn't have thought about doing that in Photoshop. And sort of a very natural way of um, of working with perfect layers. And and pretty cool to change that blending mode. Uh, and um, and have it work. So again, we'll go on from here. Whoops, sorry about that. Gonna throw that out. And Brian, any questions at this point before I? Because the next one is going to really uh, bump it up a, a quite a bit here. Um, there were a few questions in terms of uh, you know um, environmental questions in terms what camera you use. Do you use a um, are you using a, a tablet? And also, if you can repeat your process of split toning. Um, I, and that's a, so far. I think I'm handling everything else. Okay. All right. Let me um, let me go back to let me adjust the split toning one first. So split toning in Lightroom is something that uh, is completely non-intuitive. Let me just go down to the panel here, because if I just take my hue slider, for example, actually let me just let me back this off for a second. You'll see if I take my hue my hue and move it, there's virtually no effect, and um, you know that's an issue. The way to see the effect is to hold down the option key, and then you can move the slider so you can get to the tones it is that you're looking for. In this case, I was looking for sort of a sepia look, which is somewhere in here. Then you uh, apply saturation onto that, and that's, that's where the effect comes from. So I did, um, I did a blend of uh, basically warming the highlights and then cooling the shadows and then balancing it out much more to the warm side than to the to the cool side. Um, the other question was about cameras, I believe, uh, and both of these are with a 5D, uh, Canon 5D Mark II. Uh, other ones are typically with a 1DS Mark III. Cool. So um, the next one is the most complicated one. I'll come back, just for sake of time, I'll come back to two other ones that I want to do. Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna let you know up front that I, I really I pushed it on this following one, and um, we'll hope that it works correctly. Um, it, it's very very memory intensive, and I'm sure the final releases, even real beta releases, will totally do exactly what we want it to do. Um, but if there's a problem, um, I still want to take the chance and show you because it's really kind of a neat thing. And these are um, three kite surfing images. And what I want to do is basically combine all of them so that we have one, uh, one image with the kite surfer in different rotations uh, in the frame, um, which is, I mean, really kind of neat. So uh, I'm going to select, start out with this one and this one. And we're going to go to perfect layers. And I'm going to lower my opacity so I can see sort of both images. There we go. And I'm going to move this one so that my horizon line actually matches up. So somewhere's over here to start with. And again, I'm using the move tool there. And now I'm going to go 
to my brush, and I'm going to keep my fingers crossed a little bit, and uh, let's see, paint out, and I'm going to start by painting out, in essence, this. Let's see, paint out, correct. So I'm going to bring in this component, and we'll get the kite, clean up the left side here. And now I'm going to sort of redo the water area. Like that. Clean up the top. And we're going to move opacity up now. And let's just clean this up a little more. Clean that up. Clean that edge up. Clean this edge up. There we go. And I'm not using a tablet. I'm actually using my mouse, believe it or not. Uh, I actually like the mouse. So there's our sky. So there's part one. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to merge these. And now I'm going to save this composite back to Lightroom. And that part was successful. Whoops, sorry about seeing the weather there in Miami. I'm going to close perfect layers. So, uh, so there's, there's part one, if you will. There's the, the composite. Um, and now I'm going to add into that a, the, a third image, which is this one over here, um, to uh, sort of add on the left side. So you'll have a sequence of the uh, kite surfer getting air and then rotating and then coming down for a landing in, in one frame. And um, let's give this a try. So again, I have those two selected. I'm going to go to Plug-in Extras to Perfect Layers. I want to just uh, jump in there for a second, Seth. You can yep. keep working. So there's a, a few good questions in terms of, you know, um, I don't see Lightroom asking, uh, I think it was uh, just Joseph just asking that, like normally when you send an image from Lightroom to, to Photoshop, Lightroom will ask you, uh, depending on the file format, do you want to work on the original uh, copy or copy with Lightroom adjustments? The reason why Lightroom is not asking you this is because when you take a single image or multiple images from Lightroom and you send it to Perfect Layers, the very first thing that Perfect Layers does is it converts, it creates a PSD file. So you'll actually see if you're quick enough or if you go back to your Lightroom catalog, you'll see a PSD file there. And that's what Perfect Layers is working on. It's not actually working on your individual images, so it's non-destructive in that way. If Seth were to go to File Save, like he did, the the um, that PSD file would be updated automatically with whatever masking and blending he did. So I just want to bring that up as well. And that's that's it, Seth. I didn't mean to interrupt. Okay. Otherwise. So, no, no problem. So um, um, I'm going to very cautiously move this over to the left now. And I'm going to go to my crop. And I'm actually going to cut this. Give me a little more space to work with. There we go. And then on background one. I'm going to paint out, let's see, increase my opacity here, go back to my brushes, and add him in, clean up the sky here. Increase my opacity again. Okay, so this one comes in. That one comes in. That's cleaned up. 
And then we're going to just clean up around the edge here. And you get the idea. I'm going to be a little sloppy here, but that's pretty cool. And I should use a smaller brush, but you get, you know, again, you, you get the idea. And very, very neat to be able to get something like that, um, all non-destructive, and, you know, rather quick. And, you know, again, if I wasn't doing a webinar and I was actually spending a little more time, I would have, uh, you know, altered my brush size and whatnot. But still, pretty I'm actually very, very impressed, and then I can take this, save this back into Lightroom, and continue in a, uh, a non-destructive workflow, which I mean, really is um, uh, an absolutely an awesome thing to do. Um, I, I have had some uh, minor issues when I try to do lots and lots of images, I think because of memory issues, but these are all things that they're going to uh, get worked out. And um, I'm actually, really impressed with the, with the results. I mean, pretty amazing. I want to, you just kind of hit a, a point that I, uh, several people brought up, Seth, and I want to bring it up. So Seth and I were actually working l last night. We were uh, working, I was in his computer, and we were getting this, um, you know, trying to play around with this image, this masking composite. And the questions that were coming in, Seth, were, were well, why can't Seth or why doesn't Seth why doesn't send Seth multiple? Why does Seth open all three at the same time? Exactly. And so <laughs> well, there are some issues. I'll, I'll give you an, the, the honest answer is that, Brian has a series of images that it works absolutely perfect on. Um, I got jinxed, and, and <laughs> um, when I did uh, moving one image, I was fine. When I went to move two, um, I was getting some unexpected crashes, and I did not want to have that happen today. So I took, uh, I took the liberty of doing it um, uh, is, is two different um, compositions as opposed to one, and that's a, yep. a straight-out honest answer. Absolutely, exactly. I mean, we're not here. We're not trying to hide anything. And in fact, what we can do when Seth is done with his is, I can I'll, I'll share my screen, and we can do one where I can send uh, four images at one time uh, to to composite in the same way. This is kind of what we refer to it. Some people refer to it as a motor drive sequence. You kind of getting multiple animations of in one frame from different images. So we can do that um, absolutely. And to answer the question out there, you can send as many images as you want in there. Now. The only limitation is your how much RAM you have and the overall computer performance. Um, the more images you take in, the more RAM will be taken up. So, um, but that's not to say that you can't send more. I actually applaud Seth for doing it this way because I really wanted him to show this particular image because we were looking at it. And I'm like, man, this is a really cool example. And he found I, I didn't even think he was going to show it because we couldn't get it going consistently. But he found a way around it. So, Seth, I do applaud you for that. Well, well, thanks, Brian. And you know, it's one of those things where you don't want to ever give up. So, uh, yep. I, I I sit here and I was just hoping that it wouldn't crash, but it didn't. And and it, it, it logically, may have done this multiple times this morning. As long as I did it with these particular images, as long as I did uh, two at a time, I had I had absolutely no problem at all. Um, those those are really the. Uh, I mean, that was sort of the the real biggie I wanted to do. Um, I, I can do a couple more, or you, if you want, I'd, I'd actually like everybody to see that one that you have, Brian, because it works. Yep. It works so well. And then if there's a time, I'll. There's two other ones I can do, but you know, I, I got the just the cross of what I what I wanted to explain today, and uh, yep. the other two re images are are just sort of uh, almost repeats of what I some of the stuff I did. So. Yep. Well, I'll I'll do. Right now, I'll take control, and I'm going to show you guys uh, some stuff. I'm also going to go into some more of the details. I saw some I saw some questions coming through in terms of um, uh, bit depth and file formats. It'll be perfect. Layers will take will convert a PSD based using the bit depth that you have. So if it's an 8-bit file or 16-bit file, that's what it's going to use. So I've got this image. We can do this image and the other fun one that we can. We'll do two of them. If, um, the other fun one is this um, the uh, snowboarder. I'm actually going to delete these two. Again, whenever you send images to perfect layers, a PSD file is created in the folder. Um, so you can, if you don't end up saving it in perfect layers, just delete the PSD file. And there were a few questions about aperture. Can this be used in aperture? So I actually recorded a video yesterday, and I'm just waiting for it to get published on our website. Um, and it walks through how you can use perfect layers in aperture. You can select multiple images and use it as an external editor. Um, I'm hoping to get that on our Perfect Layers product page today. Um, I just want to get the video approved. So, it, it, but, 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 in the final release, it will be fully baked in. 
you won't have to do anything. Uh, so that's just this is kind of a temporary stopgap solution because we want to try to let as many people use it as possible. One final other comment that I want to make: if you go to your this is Mac or PC, if you go to your program files or your applications folder, Perfect Layers is a standalone product. You can just double click it right here and um, launch it, and then go to File Open. So for those of you who are using Bridge, say, if you want to uh, go into Perfect Layers, go to File Open, navigate to your JPEGs or your RAW files, and then work on them uh, that way. So and that works for anyone, any product, really. Um, all right, so let's do the roller coaster first. So here I have four images. I'm going to go to File, Plug in Extras, and let's send it in uh, to Perfect Layers. Now, um, I always like to bring this up. Actually, right away, you can see in the background here, you, there's that PSD file. This is the file that Perfect Layers is going to be working on. These four images now are, are not going to be touched. But if you're new to Perfect Layers, don't, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of uh, being uh, hypocritical because whenever I see any window that pops up on a newly installed product, I immediately turn off short launch and I hit close. But because this is a public preview of Perfect Layers, I really urge you guys to go through and read these slides that we built in and then when you're done just turn it off because it has a lot of good information we actually took a lot of time to make sure that um, you know it answers some questions and helps demystify the product so now I'm gonna hit close by hitting close it'll actually launch here are the four images now the way I like to work when I work on masking is I'll start at the bottom two so you can see here's layer one with the first car layer two layer three, layer four. You can reorder these by dragging and moving them around and you can also rename. So I can double click this and say first, you know, second, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you can duplicate layers. So if I selected these two layers at once and hit copy, it would create duplicates. Or if I selected these two images and hit merge, it would flatten the two images into one layer. And then you can also delete them. So the very similar functionality that you'd find in Photoshop. So here, there was actually a question earlier, um, and I hope that person is still on the line. The, the person uh, sent me a question saying, when I'm masking out, I'm seeing uh, the, the, my cursor is having a checkerboard um, trail it. That'll happen if you're on the, and this will happen in Photoshop as well. If you're on the bottom most layer and you use your masking brush and you're brushing out, um, you'll sometimes get this, uh, let me hide this, you'll get this checkerboard. And what it's basically doing is it's revealing the underlying layer. So I'm going to reset this mask. So that's, that happens if you're masking out from your bottom layer. Because think about it. If you're masking out from your bottommost layer, you're revealing the actual transparent background behind it. So just reset your mask there. I'll reset my mask here. So I've got, you can see, second layer, I've got my car here. First layer, I've got a car right over there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my masking brush. I'm going to paint out on the second layer to reveal that first car. So we're all good there. Now I'm going to move up to the next layer. So the third layer, we can rename this to third, so it's uh, more easier to be uh, visual recognition. We'll turn that on. Now I'm going to use a different tool. I'm going to use my trim tool. The trim tool is a little scissor, and you basically make a selection around the area of your layer that you want to keep. So in this case, I just want to keep this car. And I'm going to adjust the selection here and when I'm done I'm going to hit return. Now when I hit return what's going to happen is perfect layers will automatically create a mask and remove everything except for this area. So I hit return, boom. Now you can see that I clearly hit my shutter too quickly. I didn't give enough time for that car to, to um, go through. So what I can do is I can use my masking brush and just paint out, I'll make the um, the brush smaller, but I'll just paint out one of those rows, pretend those people never even existed, to give it a little bit more of a realistic uh, separation. And then we can just repeat that process one more time. Here I can, in this case here, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm just going to select this and make a uh, mask, hit enter, and there we go. Here are our four images. Now, if I want this to be a JPEG or a TIFF file, I can go to File, Export. So those of you that are familiar with Lightroom or Aperture are familiar that non-destructively, the reason why Lightroom is non-destructive is because it never actually saves over your image. It forces you to export. So it creates a whole new image with, with your changes. So here you can select JPEG or TIFF to save your image and um, save this where you want it to go. 
Now, if I go to File Save as opposed to File Export, it's going to overwrite that PSD file that it created initially. So we're going to let it run its process right now, and I'm going to show you something um, because I want to make this point very clear. Seth kind of also made it earlier. This is a alternative layered workflow solution for Lightroom. It's very fast. It's going to get even faster. And it's, it's basically for those people, especially if you're not a Photoshop or an Elements owner, this is a perfect alternative. However, I, I'm, a, I'm a Photoshop power user as well. I'm all about speeding up my workflow. I did this with, if I didn't have to show this to you in person, with that trim tool, I could have this done in 10 seconds. But watch here what happens. If I right click on this image, this is the PSD file, and I go to edit in Photoshop, and I'll edit the original, you'll see that Photoshop will fully recognize this file. There are my four layers. You can see the titles are uh, brought in. You can see that these are the trim tools, and we have our masks. So if I wanted to do something like add a certain, let's say I stamp this uh, to a whole new image, and I do something like, um, this is a total, this will be crazy, but let's just get a lasso. I'm not even sure if this is going to work, but let's say I just draw a lasso over here, and I go to uh, filter, blur, uh, radial blur, or yeah, radial blur, I think it is. Yeah, go to zoom, the direction of the blur of the cars. That way, let's bring up the blur. So you can see how I'm adding, and this is very sloppy, but this is something I would normally do in Photoshop. Or let's say I wanted to mask in a different sky because this sky is purely boring. I can use Mask Pro within Photoshop to get the, the masking, or I can use photo tools. So it's all about figuring out where the tools work in your workflow how they fit in. So I'm not going to save this one. Um, and then we have this other one, and I'll show you just how quickly um, there was a question about whether there's auto alignment of images. And right now there is not an auto alignment. You have to manually align. So and uh, this will make sense in this, perf in this uh, example here. So there, just again, there's the PSD file that gets created. I'm going to hit close. Here are my four images. And again, we start at the bottom. I always recommend st if you've got a stack of images that you're masking, start from the background and move up. So you can see if I drop my opacity down, I don't know if you guys can tell, but there's a, the, this is a, a series of images that my colleague Dan Harlicker took, took, and he didn't have a tripod, so there's a little bit of motion. So what you'll want to do first is you'll want to align these images so you kind of can get it so that the mountain kind of is aligned. And for those of you that may not know, the arrow keys on your keyboard work. The up, down, left, right, they'll move it one pixel in the direction you hit. So if you want to make fine alignments, you can do that. Now here, all I need to do is bring my opacity up. I'll use the trim tool. Just kind of get a really tight selection. Hit return. And then repeat the process. So this is for, the, for you sports photographers out there. Um, drop down the, this should give you a really cool idea. If I, again, if I didn't have to kind of narrate what I'm doing, I can get this, I'll bust this out in, you know, probably 10 or 15 seconds. The key is also remember to bring up your opacity before you start masking in. Um, and so here I'll just kind of draw my selection and you can see how we're building it up. Drop the opacity, select my move tool. This one had the most uh, misalignment. And so I'm just gonna kind of get that over there, bring the opacity up and then get my trim tool. And then start. I usually start at the furthest out corner, in which case the bottom right corner was the one that stuck out the furthest for my selection. And there you go. There's my motor drive sequence. I go to File, Save, and update the um, the uh, PSD file. So there, there's your image. Now, if I want, I can go into my Lightroom Develop module. I can go do any. I can add some clarity, bump up the contrast. Um, drop down saturation. If it's too blue for you. Boost up vibrance, um, or you could just go and convert it to a black and white image, or do whatever you know, whatever presets you have. So right now, it, you've you've created your new source image. You can add noise reduction. You could do anything you want, um, and that's kind of where Perfect Layers comes into play for a workflow. Uh, so that's that's how I would use it. So. What I'm going to do is, let me see if there are any quick questions for Seth specifically. Um, you can use Photoshop Elements, absolutely. Um, 
the PSD file works, you know, where, wherever you are. And I'm actually going to do a quick experiment here. I didn't have a chance to experiment with this, but let's just say I have um, photo tools. All right, let me see if there's a PSD file. So here's a PSD file. Let me see if I bring this into, I don't know if it's going to retain the layers, but it might. Let's hit close. Okay, so it creates a copy, which is fine. Now, if we go to file, let me close this. Go to perfect layers. Open a perfect layers, file open. Let me go to that file right there. Here's a, yeah, let's open this up. Okay, it, it opened up the copy of it. That's fine. That's the problem. I have to open up the original. I want to see if it's going to retain files of a different PSD. Okay, so that's right. For now, it doesn't support opening that up. In the future version, you'll be able to open up um, a layered PSD file in perfect layers. Right now, it's not there. You can only create it. I totally forgot about that. When we release it midsummer, let's say you had a separate PSD file like this one. This is one of my images, and it actually has two layers on it right now. You'll be able to open it up in perfect layers and have the layers uh, information there. But I just wanted to check that out. And those those are the types of things I have no problem showing you the full transparency of what the product currently can and can't do. It will give you ideas of how you can use it without worrying about you know wasting time. Can this do this or that right now? It will be able to do it though. All right, let me see if there are any other questions. Um, I should also point out, Brian, that I've had, yep. um, uh, it's not like I've been using this for months on end. Um, I believe we spoke about this about less than a week ago. Yep. And it really, you really can pick up what you can do with it pretty, pretty quick. I actually was traveling for four days and spent probably no more than than a day and a half really um, picking images and playing with and playing around with it and um, uh, you know certainly that's different than Photoshop yep and I believe the I, the price and I, I don't quote me on this I think it's 159 for new customers if you are now here's a very important point if you already own the perfect photo suite if you're a perfect photo suite 55 five owner layers is free for you you'll get perfect layers for free if you're new to the product, um, so if you buy the Perfect Photo Suite now, you'll still get Perfect Layers for free. If you just want to buy it individually, I think it's $159. Um, so that's uh, that's just a point I want to make. We, we're, we're not charging more to our existing customers. If you're a Plugin Suite 5 customer, you know that you should get you get Perfect Photo Suite 5.5 five for free. That's a free upgrade, and then you get Perfect Layers for free as well. So we, we really want to you know, maximize the life cycle of our products with our customers. So. Brian, somebody just sent me an email. They want to know what the icon is in the right-hand corner of your black and white. And what that is, is it's saying that the uh, that image was edited in an outside application and would you like uh, Lightroom to overwrite and incorporate this metadata? That's exactly right. <laughs> exactly right, and uh, <laughs> I don't even know why I'm confirming. Seth, Seth is one of the Lightroom gurus. Um, yeah, the the metadata was updated, so you can either up overwrite it or um, or merge it. Um, so I'm just looking at uh, and Seth. I really appreciate that you're sticking around. I'm just looking at some of the questions. Um, so Ron's asking, and so I want to make this clear. Ron's saying, so let's say you worked in perfect layers, you you did your masking, and you hit file save. Does it appear in Lightroom? Absolutely, Ron. So here is the image, um, and you can go into the develop module. Go to you. I'm going to close down my presets because I don't need them. But you can see it imported as it basically imported once I hit the file save. And then I added these settings so I can go back to the original state from perfect layers and do whatever I want. So I'm also going to make this example again because there were a few questions that came in. Again, if I send this to Photoshop, the original layers and the masks are retained along with the, the layer titles. So I didn't rename my titles here, but the layer titles are renamed. The masks are locked to those layers, and you work on them as you see fit. And Brian, I also point out that um, one of the things that I was playing with is, is when you bring it back into into Lightroom, you can also make a virtual copy from that and then go again 
sort of go further in Lightroom, um, especially in an image like this with the, with the composite, where you could do all kinds of other things non-destructively in Lightroom, which is actually That's a, it. really kind of cool to, to do. And, and that would be, I mean, it's a much more difficult task to try to go through Photoshop doing that kind of thing. So That's a great point. I'm actually... You know what? Really quickly, that's a great point. Let's just convert this to black and white. So, what Seth said was, he, we, this is our original Perfect Layers composite image. I sent these four images to Perfect Layers, and I used masking to create this motor drive sequence. Now, what I did was I created a virtual copy to Seth's point, and I just used one of Lightroom's built-in presets to convert it to black and white. If we want, we can now send it back to Perfect Layers. Right. And yeah, and um, we can do a blending mode. Right. So you can and see actually really the, cool. there's the, the other PSD file that gets created. And then we can try like one of the blending modes here. Maybe one of them is will be actually pretty cool. Like that multiply if you drop down the opacity, that could be cool. Overlay looks very cool if you want for a very kind of high key look. And then here's let's do hard light. Let's drop down the opacity to kind of cut it back a bit. But there you go. Now you go to file save. And what I want to point out is that this virtual copy is a sort of, you know, it's a virtual copy. It's a non-existent file. It's a duplication of the metadata, yet uh, Perfect Layers is, is reading that um, correctly and then saving it back as yet another uh, PSD file, which is I mean, yep. really, really cool. Exactly. And now I can go to File, Export, Export it to JPEG to, on my desktop. And then there is my JPEG. This is totally non-destructive because this is a separate file. So Perfect Layers is actually, a, it's a very versatile, even in its kind of infancy stage as a public preview release. So I hope that that kind of helps demystify um, some of the, the I guess, you know, what, what is Perfect Layers? Why do I need to use it? If, you're not, if you are comfortable with Photoshop, if you're an owner of Photoshop and you, um, that's your preferred method of layered, a layered workflow solution, continue using it. But there are so many photographers who are Lightroom only or Aperture only who don't have Photoshop because, you know, extended, the extended, um, Photoshop extended is a thousand dollars, I believe. So now, and, and sometimes you don't even want to use Light, uh, Lightroom el or, or other Photoshop elements because it's overkill. For those of you that are Lightroom users or Aperture users that want a layered workflow solution that is kind of has a small footprint on your computer and works very well and it's going to work even better give Perfect Layers a shot. That's why it's free right now. We want you to evaluate it for yourselves. Um, and uh, Seth, I'm starting to get some really positive feedback on your, on, this is actually Gary, Gary's comment is exactly why I'm glad Seth did this, why we have our All-Star Week. I can show you a thousand and one examples, but I also do every webinar for On One Software. I want to show you our friends of On One, the masters of our products and the masters of photography, um, how they use it. So, Seth, you know, I really appreciate it. I, I do. No problem. It's been actually a lot of fun, Brian. And, um, and you know, it's something that I'm definitely going to use in my own workflow. And, um, uh, you know, people should enjoy it. That's what it's there for. Yep. Um, I see a, a ton of questions coming through. And, <laughs> well, um, there are a lot. When, will, what new stuff will be available in the full version? Chris asked, asked a great question. What stuff will be available in the new version? Go to our website. So if you go to um, ononesoftware.com, um, oh, I'm watching the grid. Let me go to ononesoftware's website. And then if you go to, let me move the questions module. If you go to learn more and then go to the, uh, where is it? There's an FAQ somewhere. Oh, there it is. Under the learn more, over under the overview, click on the view public FAQ. We list out um, what will be coming in Lightroom and what uh, what is not. You know what our known issues are. So here, the second uh, article, upcoming features and known issues. This is really important. So here is what's coming. Here are some of the known issues. One, there's someone that asks, can you rotate layers? No, not yet. Um, currently, you can resize layers and you can adjust their transparency or their opacity, but you cannot rotate. Normally, you'll put your cursor in the corner, like in Lightroom, if you go to Lightroom here, um, and we just hit R to rotate. If I put my cursor in the corner, you can see this little curved arrow. 
that allows me to rotate. This is coming in uh, the, the uh, final version. So I, I do welcome you to look at that stuff. There it is, rotate layers. Um, Brian, I'll point out one other thing that I've actually yes. found um, fun is uh, to take an image and, you know, like uh, you, know, you shoot a sunrise or something where the foreground is, um, is way too dark and the, and the sky is blown out. If you shoot it at about the midpoint, and then you make a virtual copy so that you, in one, you actually bring the sky down completely. The other one, you sort of open up the foreground completely, and then use um, perfect layers to sort of blend the two. It, it, it's an amazingly similar, amazingly similar t to a well-done HDR image, um, and um, very, very cool. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, the... the a lot of possibilities, that's the point. Oh, it, it, you took the words out of my mouth. There are so many possibilities, um, the permutations. It, I, actually, I never even thought about that, Seth, the, the example before of taking a virtual copy of a composite image and going back at the perfect layers. Right. You just, and this is kind of why I'm glad Seth was on the call, because um, I want to show you. Um, so, and yeah, Chris, we, we are getting a masking bug, which is going to be awesome. I can't wait for that to come through. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to finish up, Seth, uh, if you don't mind. I just have some more slides that I want to go through, and I also want to show you how you can learn more about Seth. And I'm going to give you my email address. I saw there were a lot of questions coming through, and I apologize that we didn't get to them. Um, but uh, email me your questions when I get to that slide. I promise I'll respond to them. Um, so the public preview release, again, I want to reiterate. Not everything, as you just saw on our website, is there. It's coming, though. Um, and there may be some bugs. Uh, I, I, I applaud Seth. So we found a bug yesterday uh, working on his local environmental copy of Perfect Layers, but he figured out a way to get it going and show you guys his motor drive sequence. So, you know what? This reminds me. If you go into Perfect Layers, this is the best way for, for us to hear from you. Um, if you go to Perfect Layers and you go to Help, and then you go to Provide Feedback, it'll open up this web page here the same one that I showed you. Scroll down to the bottom and you'll see this link that says contact us here. If you select this, it'll automatically create an email with the email address and the subject filled out and let us know um, what, uh, you know, your feedback. This is the best way to get to us, specifically for Perfect Layers, um, because it's, it, it's going to a Perfect Layers dedicated email address. Um, okay, so this um, this release expires on June thirtieth, two thousand eleven, and we my colleague Dan and I recorded a bunch of videos showing you how to use the different tools in Perfect Layers. This webinar is being recorded um, with Seth, so it'll be available. Um, and if you don't know where to get Perfect Layers, just go to our website. You can't miss it once you're there. Um, you'll be able to download the public preview for free, thirty two and sixty four bit Mac and Windows and currently full support for Lightroom and that video I have will show you how to get into Aperture which is Apple only. So Seth, Seth, uh, I, I can't thank you enough for kicking off this All-Star Week to learn more about Seth. And, yeah, my pleasure. Um, Seth has a bunch of awesome, if you're, if you're looking to get more knowledge around the Lightroom, if you want a taste of what the D65 workshops are like, just go to my the archive and watch Seth's video from last week where he went into amazing detail of the develop module of Lightroom. Um, and that's just a small portion of what he does. So you can go to d-65.com, learn more about his workshops, learn more about Seth. If you need to reach out to him, you can get to him there. Um, and, uh, you know, I welcome it.